and then well, uh, thank you, Char. Thank you, Charco, for uh, for this introduction. And I'm really happy to uh, to be back in Aspatar in Doha again. And it's a pleasure to uh, be involved in this session and to talk about uh, the hip. We today already heard some nice talks about uh, the groin, terminology, anatomy, and surgery. And now I want to dive a little bit deeper into the groin, like to the hip, uh, with a special focus on FAI. I don't have any conflicts of interest. And as you have heard in the previous uh, talk, uh, groin pain has been classified into different categories. And a very good paper on this were the DOA agreement, which defined groin pain into three categories. And the first category of groin pain uh, was divided into clinical entities of adductor-related groin pain, iliopsoas, inguinal, and pubic-related groin pain. What they also mentioned in this paper were two other categories, and these were hip-related groin pain and a category other. And I'm going to focus on the hip-related groin pain. In the DOA agreement, they stated that there was agreement that pain uh, from the hip joint should always be considered as a possible cause of groin pain, but it wasn't the scope of the DOA agreement to reach consensus on hip-related groin pain. And that is why we organized in 2018 a consensus meeting in Zurich on hip-related pain. And we very recently published a infographic on that. And I want to talk you through this infographic really in my presentation. And we're going through this infographic step by step. So a little bit of background. Uh, the consensus meeting was in 2018. And there were diff different experts from different backgrounds, like there were physiotherapists, orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine uh, practitioners and scientists, uh, uh, biomechanics, and also radiologists involved. So really uh, a lot of people from different uh, backgrounds involved. Before this meeting, we did systematic searches of literature on hip-related pain and the questions we wanted to answer. And then we tried to reach agreement with this whole group. And we did that with the literature uh, we, we searched beforehand. Then we had discussion sessions in Zurich. And then we tried to come up with, with recommendations uh, uh, related to hip-related pain. And let me talk you a little bit through this infographic. For all, cons for all recommendations, we use the Likert scale from zero to nine, which indicates the level of consensus we reach on certain recommendations. Let me start with recommendations which were meant for clinicians and for researchers. And here you can see that we reached agreement on how to classify hip-related pain in young active adults. We reached consensus on classifying hip-related pain into femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, acetabular dysplasia, and or hip instability, and a third category of other conditions. And these are actually conditions uh, of soft tissue uh, injury like labrum, cartilage, or ligamentum teres uh, injuries. Often, we see those uh, specific types of conditions like labral uh, lesions or cartilage lesions together with the first two entities like femoral acetabular impingement and acetabular dysplasia. Sometimes there's no underlying bony uh, morphological uh, uh, characteristics of femoral acetabular impingement or dysplasia, and then you can classify those people into the other category. So let me focus on femoral acetabular impingement. Here you can see on the left side the normal spherical femoral hip, and in the middle, a hip with chem morphology. And during motion of the hip, this chem morphology can impinge into the acetabulum. And this, this movement, if that 
occurs, we call it femoral acetabular impingement. But this is a little bit a simplified version of what femoral acetabular impingement is. And in 2016, we held the Warwick Agreement of Femoral Acetabular Impingement Syndrome. And as you can see here, we defined femoral acetabular impingement syndrome as a triad of symptoms, signs, and radiological findings. And as you can see here, the radiological findings don't tell you everything, but I will come back to that later. Femoral acetabular impingement syndrome also consists of symptoms and clinical signs, which should all be consistent with the diagnosis of femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. So let me start first with symptoms. Which symptoms are characteristics for FAI syndrome? Mostly people complain of pain deep in the groin or in the hip. And when we did those, it also became apparent that it's pretty cultural defined whether patients will call and say, well, I have groin pain or I have hip pain. That really differed between the countries involved. But it's not only groin or hip pain. As you see, can see in the figure, uh, the pain can also felt or radiate to the back, buttocks, or thigh. But what's quite typical for femoral acetabular impingement syndrome is that it's a motion or position-related pain. And besides pain, there can also be sensations felt like clicking, catching, locking, stiffness of the hip, or a restricted range of motion of the hip. Then when we go to the clinical signs, the, the Warwick Agreement defined the presence of FEI syndrome, the clinical signs as a positive FADIR test and restricted range of motion, most typically decreased internal rotation or flexion. But then let's go back to the Zurich Agreement and which recommendations we did there for clinicians. In the Zurich Agreement, the recommendation was a negative flexion adduction internal rotation, or the FADIR test, helps to rule out hip disease. So let me explain the difference. So the Warwick Agreement says FAI syndrome should have a positive FADIR test, while the recommendation in the Zurich Agreement states that a negative FADIR test helps to rule out hip disease or FAI syndrome. Well, I can you explain that because when we went into the literature, the FADIR test has a really high sensitivity, but also a very low specificity. So that means that people with FAI syndrome often have a positive FADIR test. But also, a positive FADIR test is also very highly prevalent in people without FAI syndrome. So a positive FADIR test doesn't really discriminate between people with and without FAI syndrome. What we also found is that there is only a low shift in probability of diagnosing FAI syndrome before and after the FADIR test. So let me explain that a little bit more and a little bit of background of that literature. First of all, studies looking at this are mostly of quite low uh, 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 quality. Um, but also, those studies uh, mostly are not designed to test the diagnostic accuracy of the FADIR test. And lastly, they are mostly performed in high volume hip surgeon practices, which means that patients included in those studies already had a very high a priori probability to have FAI syndrome. So a positive test didn't change a lot of that probability after the test. So that's important to take in mind. So for the Zurich Agreement, we made a cautious recommendation that a negative test helps to rule out FAI syndrome in people with hip-related pain. And we couldn't find sufficient evidence on the diagnostic, uh, uh, the diagnostic uh, Sorry, on the diagnostic value of restricted range of motion. 
imaging findings. So that's the third category of the Warwick Agreement. And in the Warwick Agreement, uh, we stated that radiological findings of either CAM or pinson morphology or both should be present uh, to diagnose FAI syndrome. Let's see what the Zurich Agreement uh, recommends for this. First of all, we reached agreement that the diagnostic utility of imaging for hip disease and FAI syndrome in people with hip-related pain is only limited. So that's quite similar to the, uh, to the clinical signs. And imaging should always be combined with the patient's symptoms and signs. And when it comes to imaging, what type of imaging should you use? Then we recommend it to start with an AP pelvic view and a lateral femoral head view. That can be a cross, cross table view, that can be a frog leg view or done view. Uh, it should be a lateral femoral head neck view um, in the first um, uh, workup of those patients. And most often you already can see uh, the morphological uh, 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 characteristics you're looking for. You can you can see a pincer morphology or chem morphology, but you can also appreciate other types of diseases. When you want to go further and you're interested in the soft tissues like the labrum or the cartilage, uh, we recommend to do the cross-sectional imaging. But for this third point, I won't go in further detail, but I would like to discuss the second point a little bit further. As I said, it's just a little bit similar to the clinical signs. If you look at the symptoms, signs, and radiological findings, all of those in isolation are not really telling you much. You have to combine them. And let me show that with an example. This is a very recent study uh, from the FORCE cohort. The FORCE cohort is a cohort from Australia, which included both symptomatic and asymptomatic football players. One group of 184 symptomatic players had hip pain and a positive FADIR test, and the control group didn't have hip pain and had a negative FADIR test. And if we then look at the chemophology prevalence, we found that the chemophology prevalence in males was 78% in the symptomatic group and 76% in the male group. So instead of using the words like sensitivity and specificity, this also gives you a sense that the chemophology itself, the presence of chemophology itself, can't distinguish people with or without hip pain or positive FADIR test. And if you look then at females, there was a 42% prevalence of chemophology in the symptomatic group and a 25% uh, uh, prevalence in the asymptomatic group. Uh, and this wasn't a st statistically significant difference. So also in females, the presence of chemophology couldn't distinguish uh, 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 symptomatic and asymptomatic football players. And this was a unique study because it didn't only look at hip pain, but it also looked at people with a positive FADIR test. And also in that group, the imaging alone wasn't uh, sufficient to distinguish those groups. And this is actually in line with most of the cross-sectional studies on this topic. And if you look at the prospective studies on this topic, we see a little bit of conflicting results. One study published by Van Klei et al. showed that large camophology at baseline was associated with hip and groin pain after five years, but not with the HAGOS after five years. Another study uh, showed that a camophology at baseline was associated with hip pain after four and a half years. So they showed a positive association. But again, another study from, uh, from, from DOA actually, from, from Andrea Mosler, showed that camophology at baseline was not associated with future hip and groin injury, which were actually mostly adductor related injuries within two years. So also prospective studies really show a little bit of conflicting results. And if they show a positive association between uh, camophology and hip pain, then it's only a weak association and only in a small subset of people.
And interestingly, this is very different from the association between imaging findings like chemophology and osteotritis, because chemophology on imaging is consistently associated with the development of hip osteotritis in prospective studies. And also, a greater alpha angle on imaging is associated with a higher risk of OA uh, uh, in the future. And this is also be shown by uh, Josh Harry, uh, again, the force cohort. Um, and this figure needs a little bit of explanation. Here you can see uh, a hip joint. So this is the femoral head. And here you can see the acetabulum. And they scored the cartilage defects, uh, green, completely green, 0%, no cartilage defects to 100%. And if we then first look at hips without chemophology, we only see a, mild, a small percentage of football players that had cartilage defects. But if we then look at people with chemophology, we showed that uh, 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 especially in the superolateral subregion of the acetabulum, so particularly there where the chemophology enters the acetabulum, we found a higher prevalence of cartilage uh, damage. And in people with a large chemophology, this percentage was even higher. So also in the force cohort, there was a, 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 an association between chemophology and cartilage damage. And also the bigger the chemophology, the more the cartilage damage. So there's really a discrep discrepancy while we see this uh, with chemophology and, and, and cartilage damage or osteotritis. We really don't see this with chemophology and hip pain. So we, we, there, there's something that we uh, still not fully understand. So let me get back to this simplified uh, 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 image. Here you can see a chemophology again that can cause impingement within the acetabulum. And we know from surgery that even very young people can present like this with very severe cartilage damage. And we know that the CAM is associated with that, but it's probably only a very small subset of people with, with a CAM and with femoral stablum that go on onto this kind of cartilage damage. But up till now, we really can't predict who is going to develop this cartilage damage and who is not. So this brings me to the take home messages of today. In young active adults with hip related pain, comprehensive examinations of symptoms, signs and imaging findings is needed. And a combination of those can lead you to the diagnosis of FEI syndrome, dysplasia or other. All of those uh, uh, examinations in isolations can't really discriminate between the diagnosis. So you really need the symptoms, the signs, and the imaging findings together. And then you can categorize people with hip-related pain into FVI syndrome, dysplasia, or other. Thank you very much.